good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I think the toughest time of the day, when I think everybody is wanting to go back home, because electric vehicles can't solve the congestion problem for sure. But I think three-wheelers, electric three-wheelers might be able to solve that. So I think it's a good session to have. So we have a very, uh, so I almost know everybody personally as well. I think I'm, we, are, we are extremely lucky to have such a good panel today, just after the, the Shara day, in the evening when our office work is at, uh, is at peak. So uh, we have Mr. Ayush Loya, who is uh, CEO Loya Auto. We have Mr. Arora, who's the country head for ZB. Then, of course, Mr. Avdesh Dha, you know, very nuanced guy on, uh, on charging infrastructure and all the power sector regulations issues. And then we have a very enterprising Piyush, very, 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 uh, uh, you know, I would say that, that in, in my conversations, very analytical and brings in a lot of views from other sectors, how stuff can be done in India. And then, of course, you know, I'm meeting Saurav for the first time, but I've heard a lot about him from some of our common friends. So, you know, a true blue entrepreneur. So, uh, you know, a, a lot has been said uh, since the morning. And, you know, from my perspective, you know, as a consultant as well, electric three-wheelers don't seem to be as sexy a market as the other aspects. However, if we talk about the total cost of ownership economics or the kind of real issues in a country like India, what electric vehicles can solve, Three-wheelers and commercial three-wheelers based on electric seem to be the starting point for electric mobility revolution in the country. So, you know, and then of course, you know, if, we, if I talk about those upgraded electric rickshaws, the pedal rickshaws being upgraded to electric vehicles, we already have about more than 2 million electric rickshaws in the country without any government or government or regulatory intervention. So, is there... So the question that what then comes to my mind per se is, is this a market which needs to be touched or will it grow by itself? And then of course, you know, there are issues what we have heard from BSES, Rajdhani and other people is the illegal charging on electric vehicles. Lead acid batteries, they are not environmentally sustainable. So, you know, we'll try to answer some of these questions today with the panel. Broadly, sir, so we'll have three sets of questions to all of you. One set around the overall business opportunity, which the electric three-wheelers and the light commercial vehicle space uh, provides. Secondly, we'll try to focus on two specific issues, which is around availability of charging infrastructure and recycling of lead acid batteries. And thirdly, from your nuanced view, any pointed recommendations or suggestions or ideas which you, want, which you would want to convey to the friends here, or to the policy makers, which can move the market in the right direction. So we'll try to be as fast as possible. Uh, coming to the first topic on the business opportunity, and, and I'll start with Ayush on this, who comes from the traditional auto industry, that when you look at electric three-wheelers and the light commercial vehicles market, Ayush, so what kind of a business opportunity you know, does, does come to your mind? When you as a businessman look at it, which is, what is the entire space in the value chain on this market, specifically electric three-wheelers and light commercial vehicles, that seems attractive to you? Thank you. Uh, frankly speaking, if you see from uh, the old traditional way of automotive industry, electric vehicle is completely a different new space. Uh, when we started, we have not thought that this electric vehicle will evolve so fast and so differently that instead of B2C, it is now becoming, our, it is uh, adding a value change in the system. We have aggregators, we have, uh, uh, you know, people, fleet owners, we have drivers standalone who are not owning the vehicle. We have the owners who are driving the vehicle and uh, doing last mile connectivity. So frankly, there's a lot of things which has added to the complete value chain in between the OEM and the actual user or the uh, consumer of the product. So this we never thought about just five years, ten, five seven years back, which has just added a lot of you know, a uh, uh, lot of uh, technology, a lot of uh, product uh, enhancement, 
and the life cycle of the product altogether. Because when we go by a traditional format, you know, you, people are using it on a private format, people use it on the personal usage, very less uh, in civilar area we see a hugely aspect we are using them for commercial last mile connectivity. Definitely it has helped in a huge manner because the product quality expectation, uh, the range anxiety, all those questions are being answered by that last mile people who own the vehicle and who want to make sure the utility of the vehicle is the best, uh, is the best scenarios. So these kind of changes has definitely helped the industry large. EV industry we definitely see will grow further based upon this uh, technical and innovative parameters going further. Thank you. Anil, uh, you know, so what we understand from you that ZB is trying to bring in a lot of uh, experience from other geographies into how to run this segment in India. So what's your take on what kind of learnings in your experience can be brought in from other countries into running this segment in India? Yeah. <clears throat> so primarily, you know, here we are talking of, um, I think what I've been listening to is a clear segmentation of the OE, uh, sorry, uh, the digital market, uh, you know, the digital, the telematics. Uh, what we see in Europe is that there's a convergence. So we, going forward, don't see uh, the automobile industry existing as it is. We, we foresee a huge disruption in the automobile industry because uh, today it's eventually... Um, what is, what is the value you bring to the commuter? You know, I think uh, in the automobile industry, uh, the commuter has been largely ignored. Uh, so if you look at the Western world, very unlike China, uh, form factor of a vehicle becomes very important. How does it look? You know, uh, what are the features you put in? So what we've endeavored to do, and uh, we've done a pilot around this area in Gurgaon and Noida. And we find that um, the commuter today <clears throat> is an aspiring commuter. And you have a three-wheeler, which we call the auto rickshaw, which was invented probably in the 1950s. And I don't think in the last 70 years, the Indian automobile industry has really worked on it, except for the bells and whistles. So if you look at the auto rickshaw of the 60s and you look at the auto rickshaw today, you'd find a lot of commonality and similarity in the product form. So what we've done is we bought in a product, you know, and uh, we work very closely. Uh, so basically, uh, our value is bringing um, in electric vehicles energy efficiency. Because, uh, you know, a battery is a very okay. inefficient uh, form of okay. uh, refueling. Sure. There's so much you can pack sure. into a battery. Sure. So you need to make sure that your electric vehicle is built ground up. Sure. It's built as an electric vehicle and it's not built or retrofitted, you know, right. that you take an auto, you put in a right. battery and you put in right. a motor and you put a product right. on the market. We don't feel that is going to work because a lot of sheet metal, very heavy. So you have to use a large energy pack to carry that. Right. Plus you will put commuters into it. So to cut a long story short, our experience in India and Stockholm, I have 100 vehicles, is that uh, you need to seed the market with as much uh, background as you can. So you have telematics, you have digital media, and you've got to look at out-of-the-box out of revenues in fleet operations. Sure. Commuter is one form of revenue, but there, there are a lot of sure. allied forms of sure. revenue. Sure. So what we see is that we need to look at the software part. So the hardware is like an Apple phone. So, you know, the vehicle is just the hardware, but sure. it's everything around it, sure. which gives a good commuter sure. experience. Sure. Thank That's you. what we look sure. at. Sure. So while we talk about data and software, Mr. Jha, what role do you feel, or if any, is there a role in bringing the ICT or the cloud networks to upscaling the experience and, op and smoother operations of electric uh, three-wheelers in the country? Is there a role there? Uh, clearly. Uh, so, you know, we need to see, uh, we have a two clear segment in the uh, three-wheelers as well. Most of the discussions are currently hovering around B2B segment, you know, where uh, 
uh, you know, they are uh, catering. I mean, one particular organization is aggregating the vehicles and then they are, uh, you know, operating those. But the larger segment is the B2C. See, at the, at the final end, it will be the B2C. It was the individual owners who will be driving their vehicles and they would be requiring to, you know, uh, operate these vehicles. So from that point of view, the B2C segment, clearly I see that, you know, uh, the technology especially, uh, because most of the time it, the vehicle has to be on road. So obviously the charging, you know, they need to find the charging locations. They need to find the availability on the real-time basis because unlike the petrol stations and the other, uh, you know, the fuel stations, uh, initial years, they will not be knowing where are the chargers. So obviously the technology plays an important role where, you know, uh, they can see using the app or anything, you know, right. that yes, these are the chargers, these are the locations. And this becomes equally important in the battery swapping. If, if the mm. battery swapping has to go, then battery swapping by nature, the battery can be taken on. And in a country like India, you know, with the individual owners of the vehicles, if someone lends their battery, and if that battery doesn't remain secure, because by nature, if it can be taken on, how do you track that vehicle, uh, battery? How do you transact energy transactions on those batteries? So the technology plays an important role, both on the battery swapping right. as well as on the charging. Right, right. right. Piyush, we have spoken about this before, but this illegal charging of electric rickshaws, is that really an issue or is this being overblown? I don't think it's an issue here. It's uh, what percentage of people do illegal charging and uh, electricity theft is a national issue, right? Whether the theft happens for uh, running an air conditioner or whether uh, running a petrol, uh, sorry, uh, a gen, uh, you know, the farm yeah. pumps in agriculture yeah. sector or for television or for EV, it's, it's one and the same. It's a uh, in Delhi, there, it was a widespread practice, right? So you had around 70-80% of the vehicles which were illegally charged. Uh, I think that number has come down to around 4 or 5% now. So I, you rarely see a vehicle which is illegally charged now in Delhi. In some of the other states, uh, you go to UP and, and Bihar, uh, yes, I guess it's uh, still, it's still uh, a big concern. But, uh, but as a percentage of the overall electricity theft in India, that is possibly uh, s less than 0.1% of the total electricity theft in sure. India. So, I, so from uh, from our perspective, actually, it's uh, it's 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 a non-issue. On the other hand, if you look at it, right, so it has actually gone a fairly long way in uh, in pushing electric vehicles to the stage where they are, right? If if there was no free electricity, it means it's 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 perverse logic, right? But uh, but you had free fuel, yeah. The two million e-rickshaws that you that you see, had there been no free fuel. Uh, very unlikely you would have seen this market grow that fast, yeah, but it's, it's exactly. not an issue. <laughs> sure. Sort of, so let me flip the question to you from what Anil spoke about, where he spoke about uh, learnings coming from the Nordics to India on the product design. Now you are trying to build electric uh, LCVs ground up. So what in your opinion could be some of the learnings can be taken to geographies outside India? some of your learnings in terms of developing features, product features. So what has been your experience? Uh, so, um, so, we, uh, so Euler has been primarily focused on the electric commercial vehicle and within that uh, the cargo segment. And some of the learning that we saw was, uh, so majorly like, I mean, when we are designing the product, we saw like A, road condition, B, uh, weather and C was the usage. The, uh, under these three things is where we have seen uh, very varied kind of uh, inputs from what we got and we felt that if you're designing for India, I mean, you are designing for the highest amount of uh, safety perspective and let me just uh, kind of go in, in detail. So from usage perspective, even if you tell customer key this vehicle uh, does 400 to 500 kgs of payload, I mean, they would put 700, 800 kgs. I mean, you can probably tell them once or twice, but they will always do that. So your uh, motor or uh, controller, they are overly, I mean, taking current and that would either damage them if you're not protecting them. 
From temperature perspective, if you look at Delhi's average uh, high temperature, it is typically between 20 to 40 degrees and the average of uh, the months, I mean, uh, in a month that you look. And uh, that's, that's the ambient temperature. So battery pack is typically somewhere around 30 to 55, depending on what, how much payload and speed and elevation and all of that which is pretty much uh, putting like batteries at a torture condition. So if you're not uh, sort of cooling these batteries mm, or you're not very good at thermal designing of these battery packs, then you are, I mean, your battery pack is going to degrade very, very fast. Uh, in terms of road, obviously, like we have potholes, we have roads where, I mean, the half of the road is under water. So in during rainy season, so your product designing in terms of battery pack, and every, I mean, the enti entire electrical circuit has to be really, really good. On the mechanical side, because uh, I think LCV and electric, uh, I mean, three-wheeler in general, we have been building this for almost 30, 40 years, so that we have been pretty good at. But on the electrical and the battery pack and some of this, I think some of these learnings that at least we had and now we are trying to solve some of these, I think by the time we'll be done and you will be able to, let's just say, build a three-wheeler or LCV which runs for eight to 10 years in India, you will have an export quality material that you can also put it in like European market and some of that. I mean, maybe design form factor, some of those will change, but, and this you can see, like even your conventional uh, two wheelers or three wheelers, there are OEMs in India that does export to uh, other markets and we are pretty good in some of those scenarios. So I think uh, there's a huge opportunity that I think, uh, that Indian OEMs or startup or like, you know, the conventional OEM that they have is to build uh, for India and then be really good at it. And if you build for India and good, you can potentially be also be an export leader. So. So, sure. And now let's just spend a minute each on these two issues of charging infrastructure availability and recycling of batteries. So a very pointed question to you is that because you're building this, building these vehicles ground up, which battery technology would you bet on, given the Indian conditions and your analysis? Uh, yeah, uh, so we are doing lithium ion, but lithium I can ion. tell you why we are doing it. Sure. So uh, in our market, uh, I mean the cargo or the commercial vehicle market, uh, two things that is very important. One is depth of discharge, and the second thing that we looked at was temperature. Uh, so vehicle that you're using, let's just say in a private use case, two-wheeler or four-wheeler, I mean, you might have a OEM is giving you a range of, let's just say, 200 kilometers, but in a daily basis, you're using it for 40 kilometers in a day. So battery pack is being discharged to, let's just say, 40% of its, what was the capacity. So if you discharge, uh, depth of discharge is not very, very high, you tend to get a very good battery life. So the same battery pack might go to five years, seven years, 10 years. But in commercial vehicle, at least in the cargo application or even in passenger where it's being used in all, you are discharging battery pack to like 90% depth of discharge, 85, sure. or whatever is the OEM cutoff, and you're discharging that almost on a daily basis. So your sure. degradation on battery pack is very, very high. Secondly, your temperature conditions are also not sure. very favorable. So when we looked at that, I mean, one of the ways to overcompensate some of that was you increase the battery energy density uh, so that you can get more range and hence you have better DOD. But to be able to compress all of that in the volumetric space that you have in a three-wheeler or LCV, uh, you need higher energy density. And with lead acid, like that's not possible. And that's one of the reason if you see lead acid uh, battery packs being used, even in the slower speed vehicle, they run out to, I think they lose around 40 to 50% of its uh, capacity within nine months. And sure. that's, so we, that's one of the reason why we sure. went after the lithium ion, sure. uh, and you can pick sure. any of the chemistry. Sure. Piyush, so from your cross and cross industry experience and working in the uh, battery, uh, I mean the energy supply space, one business model or one innovative collaborative business model that could work towards giving reliable energy supply to electric three wheelers and light commercial vehicles for commercial use, what could be that? So I think. Uh, uh, so the only thing that ails us, so again, you know, the uh, the industry is very well, uh, you know, we all understand the cost curves now. Yeah. So uh, for uh, any, whether it's a three-wheeler, whether it's a two-wheeler, what we uh, what we have seen consistently is that uh, there is a total cost of ownership for the vehicle which goes down by almost 50%. Yeah. 
when you once you start going electric. So I'm a very strong believer that uh, whenever there is uh, one company which sets up a sets up a ecosystem uh, which enables everyone to put electric vehicles on a road in a specific city, there would be very very few elect uh, non-electric vehicles sold in that specific city. Yeah. So the only bottleneck that we all see for this industry is essentially on the charging infrastructure or the availability of charge on demand. Yeah. And uh, so the single biggest problem that I see that needs to be solved in the industry is around you know the charging infrastructure. People are attempting this in a very different way. Some people believe charging, um, you know, setting up charging piles or charging stations would be the key to solve this problem. Some people believe battery swapping would be the way to solve this problem. Others believe, you know, home charging is good enough for the problem to be solved. We believe uh, India would be a market where we will have a combination of home charging, charging stations, and battery swapping. Yeah, and the innovation that needs to come along with this is this should be a neutral third party charging infrastructure which is essentially on the lines of uh, what our companies have done uh, for the mobile industry which essentially means whether you are OEM A, whether you are OEM B, OEM C, a fleet operator A or an individual customer who owns only one loader or an e-rickshaw or a two-wheeler or a, or a, or a L5 category uh, three-wheeler, you are all treated the same. So the single biggest thing that I believe uh, would take electric vehicle industry from uh, having 2 million e-rickshaws to additional 2 million scooters, e-scooters, and 2 million uh, high-speed three-wheelers would be availability of, uh, of neutral third-party charging infrastructure, which is a combination of public charging spaces, battery swapping, and allowing home charging. Sure, yeah? sure. Mr. Dha, so specifically on battery recycling, Especially in a country where, if I can say that our sustainability goals are pretty low compared to the kind of experience you have seen in the Nordic countries, how do we tackle this issue of battery recycling? Let us say battery recycling. No, so I'm, uh, I'll not be in the position to comment on the latest uh, uh, recycling uh, because, as uh, Saurabh has said, you know, on the electric mobility front, generally it's the uh, lithium ion that will be the main uh, uh, the driver. And I would like to address, you know, the, the, the concerns regarding this recycling of the battery. So, I mean, my, my individual take on this app is this question, uh, you know, to facilitate the entire narrative of the e-mobility, or I mean, not from you, but generally from the uh, industry engagement, or it is just to defer the deployment of the electric mobility itself. Because I personally see these, these recycling issues coming in 15 to 16 years time from now because if you see the battery is still the lithium ion battery you know in the mobility uh, it will have a life of around seven to eight years and, and, and this I'm saying primarily considering that in India 90% plus of the vehicles are sold on the private segment you know be the two wheelers or the four wheelers the private con individual consumers who use these vehicles uh, when we say the battery will have seven to eight years life for the mobility it doesn't mean that it has gone to zero density so it still has energy left in that and that's a uh, adequate to use as a stationary storage as a second life. Mm -hmm. And that there it can again sustain for five, six years. So practically we are talking of 15, 16 years. And after that you will be requiring to dispose it of safely. So, and, and I'm pretty sure, you know, by the time uh, you will reach that milestone, that 15 years, you will have a full-fledged recycling industry uh, established. Having said so, as we are speaking today, you know, a uh, company like us, you know, so Fortham is offering the complete recycling services on the lithium ion, where we are able to extract 80% of the uh, critical components, uh, you know, uh, nickel, cobalt and all. And we are offering in uh, Nordic countries through our plant in Finland. And we are also evaluating the Indian market. So it's not that, uh, so work is going on the recycling, but only thing I believe that all these recycling, uh, you know, safety, the cost, these are, or, or the grid balances, these are the questions which is being deliberately put to disrupt these, you know, uh, adoptions, you know, uh, and these are the designed questions. These are not the natural questions should come uh, because load balancing, again, it's a very uh, generic, you know, uh, in India, you'll, if entire vehicle goes to the electric, as for the CA study, I'm not quoting myself, like the CA study, you know, on the national grid, there will be hardly a 5% additional energy load. That's nothing. Yes, at the local grid level, yes, there could be some issues if all the vehicles get connected at one point, point of time. So I'm saying that the questions which will, you know, the issue which will come 15 years, 20 years down the line, you know, we are posing today 
to scare or to demotivate the users? So I think these are the questions which is in the realm of the time. But uh, technology is progressing and technology will always precede these problems when sure. it comes up. Sure. Thank you. Anil, so very pointed question to you that when you talk about ZB, what charging methodology do you predict for E3 wheelers and LCVs? On-site charging or battery swapping, if you had to bet on one? So I'll agree with Saurav. Um, you know, it's going to be a mix of um, overnight charging, <clears throat> battery swapping I'm very bullish about because we are sure. actually using it. Okay. And it has increased our vehicle performance efficiency in terms of um, the number of kilometers we do in a day. Uh, you also solve the thermal issues with the battery swap because it's air conditioned. You know, because uh, we tried uh, DC quick charging in India. In winter it worked well, but uh, you know, as summer came and uh, you know, we were talking of thermal issues. With the DC charger, what happens is uh, if you put in so much current at a, at a certain time into a battery, generally your battery can get destroyed and then there are also issues around the wiring. So we have worked on DC charging. In fact, I have it outside the hotel at the Ambience Mall. Uh, so we use six kilowatt chargers. Uh, so I think it depends on how the fleet operator wants to position his fleet. And in different cities, it would look very different. So if I'm doing a mall metro point to point connect and you know, around this vicinity, it's very easy for me to do the swap because uh, the vehicle comes back after two or three kilometers and a swap a, a single 1.5 kilowatt battery gives you about 25 to 30 kilometers of range with my vehicle because my vehicle weighs just about 200 kilos. Uh, while uh, if you go, uh, you, you know, that's incubating the, the uh, market. But as you move forward and the market gets critical and you look at volumes and say you move to a city like Jaipur where you could give intra-city uh, commute solutions, there you would have to think out of the box and you know some places you'd have to put quick chargers uh, because you know for a, a battery swap you need a format where you can put the battery swap and plug it in you know the wiring and right. things like that uh, but then again um, once you use the swap then your battery balancing so with lithium you know there are cells so you have battery balancing issues which happens when you have a stationary battery so you can't use a DC charger to constantly charge the vehicle because you will have battery balancing issues. So what we do is we overnight charge. So we do a drip charge at night. Right. And during the day, we do the top up with top the DC charge. charger. So you also try and solve some of your thermal issues. So sure. I think a mix of all three would really be a solution to the problem. Very important. Sure. Sure. I wish so you heard the energy energy provider solutions, you've, you've heard the, you know, the battery solutions, you've heard the product grounds up. And then you now have the fame subsidies uh, around, you know, around manufacturing. So one recommendation or one idea, are you, are you overall happy with the overall uh, fame structure around manufacturing subsidies around electric three-wheelers? Uh, one idea if you had to give to the government, what, what would that be? I think it's still, it does not address one basic typical thing that is for the aggregators and it does not separate the battery and the vehicle. It talks about both the solutions in one go. It does not, if you, if I want to sell only batteries as far as electric vehicle because in trapping, fame subsidies doesn't apply. And for aggregators, there's no specific need which has been fulfilled from the fame subsidy. So these two areas are untouched in the policy which if can be, uh, you know, uh, incorporated, it can definitely synergize better and will give us a, a open, uh, you know, a new forum altogether. So if we address these two issues in the policy, we'll definitely have a lot of uh, faster movement of uh, electric vehicle on road. The third, which will definitely, uh, you know, help us in uh, implementing FAME subsidy is FAME subsidy, talks about the complete vehicle. So if I want to, uh, you know, go for a strapping scenarios or if I want to have a, uh, a battery infrastructure scenarios, I can't claim the fame subsidy. So this is the third area which need to be addressed again. 
in the policy. Apart from that, if I see from the vehicle perspective, from the supply chain perspective, from the demand uh, initiatives, I think it is perfect policy to be in place because we are talking about battery as a main key driver. We are talking about the energy efficiency. We are talking about make and end perspective. We are talking about the energy efficiency usage uh, on the perspective. So all those areas are definitely covered in the policy. Sure. Anil, you agree? Any so is your market affected by any of the government announcements or anything, or you are completely operating independent of them? We actually haven't focused in that sure. area a lot, uh, okay. you know. So I would not uh, sure. comment on sure. that. Mr. Jha, on the charging infrastructure guidelines, the revised guidelines which have come out on first uh, October, if I'm not wrong, any one pain point that you see in that still? See, having, having worked in government myself for 15 long years, I would say that uh, government is doing not a good service to this e-mobility adoptions by bringing on these ad hoc regulations and the guidelines. First of all, these are the guidelines. Now, uh, Minister of Power has not made very clear that under what section of the Electricity Act they are empowered to issue these guidelines. If it doesn't have any statutory effect, you know, uh, which state government will follow this one Different state governments will have a different interpretations of the guidelines. So, so that itself is, to, starting point itself is, uh, to me, it seems is flawed, uh, that uh, why there should be a guidelines. Having said so, if they have issued with the guidelines, uh, one way I'm happy that yes, when they issued with the uh, guidelines on the 14th of December last year, uh, we represented and they heard us, and then they have incorporated certain uh, suggestions which we had given. But this is a couple of points which is, uh, you know, still nagging us is one is the capping of the service fee. So at one end you are saying that this is a de-licensed activities. By the other end you are saying that whatever, f how much fee you will charge from the end consumer, that will be capped. Now, how would you cap it? You, unless, it means you are not allowing the investors to bring in the new technology because when you are capping it, it means you will have some benchmark cost. <laughs> And the benchmark cost, and if you go through the DHI's, uh, you know, EOI, which has just been closed, uh, the method which they are applying for, uh, uh, you know, reimbursement of the subsidy is the lowest cost discovered by different, you know, operators. Now, if, you're at, if your benchmark is the lowest cost, and based on that, you will be fixing the service cap, it means you are clearly going for a very low quality product, number one. Second, you know, this subsidy you are saying that this is available to, this service cap will be applicable on those projects which will be getting the government grant. So it means in the market you will have a two players, one without subsidy, one with the uh, subsidy. Now with the subsidy, the prices will be lower, you will be lowering the price. And with the sub without subsidy, they will have a higher investment, so they will have a higher price. The consumer will go to the lower price. Now, what do you are doing in the process? You are instituting or you are adding a behavior in the minds of the consumer that I am entitled to get a very low cost price. Now, once you remove the subsidy business after three years or four years, then if you don't get, if consumer doesn't get that price, their expectation is not met and there could be, you know, issues with the market. So I would say this is creating a distortion in the market. Government's role should be, uh, you know, to give the subsidy only to create the infrastructure, not to enter into the business that what price, you know, at, at what locations. I mean, who are you to say that three by three? You know, if three by three doesn't make a business sense, why the charger would be put at three by three, every three by three? So all these, you know, the government is now entering into a business, uh, dictating a business model, which I think will be a counterproductive. And third, I'm, you know, uh, I'm personally confused with the intent of the government. At the one end, you are saying that we are promoting, you know, three wheelers, two wheelers, and at the same time, the charging infrastructure guidelines is meant for high-end vehicles. You know, this 50 kilowatt charger is for the car. And car, you are saying that up to 15 lakh rupees, only the vehicles would be getting the subsidy, and beyond that, it will not. Now, this 50 kilowatt charger is applicable for Kona and, you know, other vehicles. Those are not entitled for subsidies. So Which demand side, you are giving a subsidy to 15 lakh. On the infrastructure side, you are creating infrastructure for 
non non subsidized vehicles i mean what exactly you are uh, trying to achieve so i think the entire uh, guidelines and the dhis to me it seems the fame to will be a biggest uh, detrimental to the entire e mobility adoption in india that's my view sure so so just to add to his point uh, he mentioned a 50 kilowatt charger 50 kilowatt charger <laughs> Just to accept that charge, there is only one vehicle in India, and that's Hyundai Corona. No other vehicle can ex actually accept charge from a 50 kilowatt charger. So, Piyush, one last question to you and Saurav both. Uh, as true blue entrepreneurs looking at funds from the market, both institutional and VC money, what challenges do you face in that, and and if something can be done on that? So, I think uh, the the story has changed over the last three years, right? So, when I, when I started Lithium Power, uh, the discussion was. ये ई वी चलेगी नहीं चलेगी अब ये हो रहा है कि कौन सी गाड़ी चलेगी टू व्हीलर चलेगा थ्री व्हीलर चलेगा फोर व्हीलर चलेगा आई थिंक वी मूव टू लॉन्ग वे राइट सो देर हैव बीन पॉजिटिव्स एंड नेगेटिव्स अलोंग द वे बट द फाइनेंशियल कम्युनिटी हैज बीन इट्स बीन प्रिटी सपोर्टिव राइट सो वी गट नो रिग्रेट्स अराउंड दैट येस द मनी डजन कम फ्री बट द मनी इज नॉट डिफिकल्ट टू कम एज वेल सो वॉट एवर मनी वी रिक्वायर्ड वी बीन एबल टू गेट द मनी फ्रॉम द मार्केट एट at uh, you know we just have to go out explain to people uh, it's not easy but it's not that difficult either yeah but uh, i actually see a very positive momentum over the last 3 years uh, and frankly when i started this uh, uh, this company uh, i actually had to do a lot of selling around uh, uh, you know what what is electric vehicles why should electric vehicles win yeah and then actually i had to tell about hey you know uh, what are three different types of charging and why i believe all the three different types of chargings are going to exist and the first question i always get asked by people was you know battery swap does not work anywhere in in the world and so you must be you know, out of your mind uh, putting your house on uh, uh, on the block to uh, to uh, to be the first proponent of battery swapping in india i said hey you know india would be the first company country where it will work so again business models have evolved uh, have we seen spectacular growth in the industry we haven't seen spectacular growth but it has been it, it hasn't been bad either right sort of Okay, so uh, I'm a bit young, so I'm a bit rebellious. I think a bit more, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we have just started 18 months back, so uh, I don't have a lot of context what happened early on. Uh, but I come from software industry, so before that I had a software venture. Uh, so I can compare my uh, like understanding from the previous one where we raised that time and this time. See, for uh, entrepreneurs, I think VC is anyway like it's one of the most important pillar, right? Uh, but what I have seen is there are very few investors in India who backs uh, hardware-based uh, product, and uh, I mean there's a lot of inherent risk and all of that, which is quite understandable. We have been lucky that there have been, uh, I mean, we had investors like Bloom and Emergent and a couple of folks, and we are copying, uh, talking to a couple of uh, more guys. But one of the thing that I've realized is that uh, the kind of comfort they are looking for, even in like early stage, uh, and this is no way, like this is just my stand, uh, is like it's it's very very high as in I guess compared to what I had seen early on. So I mean they are looking at like comfort of a mature stage startup at early stage, and I understand like why it's where well if you're on the other side, I mean their main thinking is you're going to compete against like not just one or two big guys. I mean, they're like 10, 15 big guys and you are going to compete against 10 of these big guys. So obviously there is a lot of risk, uh, not just from competition, but then there is uh, manufacturing and technology, product, all of that kind of risk. Uh, one of the things that I think that could have been a bit better is, uh, I mean, and just to support some of the things I think that we discussed was, uh, we discussed on the panel was the government's role. Uh, I think government has been very, at least in the recent years, I've seen that they have, their policies have become, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, going up and down, but it's uh, going toward a direction of e-mobility. So some of that, and because I think because of that, uh, a lot of interest from the investor community and some of that is in the EV segment, but still it's kind of uh, back and forth, back and forth. I mean, there is, uh, it's going forward, but uh, I mean, which I am assuming it's extremely complicated, right? I mean, there is uh, transport, there is power, there is finance, there is all of these departments interlinked. So, I mean, uh, it is bound to create confusion. I mean, nobody's, yeah, like, dealt something like these kind of transformation. 
but uh, when you have that kind of comfort, like when VCs have that kind of comfort, because they are thinking, yeah, I am going to invest, and when is this segment going to take off, and will it take five years, will it take ten years, and I have to return to my uh, LPs, and so their thinking is very different. So they would want to come in at a point when it's actually taking, going to take off. I mean, imagine we have to wait like three years for before subsidies to come in, or some of these to make sense. But yeah, I mean, overall, I think uh, as an entrepreneur, we are overly optimistic of the market, but uh, it's, it's going fairly okay, I think. Thank you. Thank you. So we have five guys here, and they are big guys and very, very busy guys. The same questions, if you ask them on emails, your emails will go unanswered. So you have this opportunity now to ask them whatever you want to. Um, uh, my question is more towards uh, the so two just types of back. Yourself. So just introduce yeah. yourself. Uh, my name is Rana Kanan. Uh, I'm from AMP. And just and, point your question. Uh, to my question is pointed to whoever wants to take the question. Um, currently, the three wheeler space is dominated by lead acid batteries. And from what I understand, the lithium ion batteries are only two or three percent. Uh, how do you see this playing out in terms of lithium ion gaining traction? And if it does gain traction, who do you think uh, is going to lead the supply? Is it going to be more Chinese or import suppliers, or is it going to be local suppliers who are assembling these uh, battery bags? Sure. Anil, do you want to take this up? Yeah. So I think um, lead acid was never a solution to mobility. You know, it was probably, um, you know, this whole concept uh, that we need to get a cheap product so that we can drive volumes and we started with I think e-scooters and at that point of time we had to bring a product to market sub 20,000 uh, so we had no choice but to leverage lead acid batteries uh, you know lead acid batteries if you look at the characteristics of a lead acid battery as it discharges the uh, performance of a vehicle goes down in proportion to the, to the discharge. So, you know, that's why you have these e-rickshaws which are creating traffic congestion because they're, they're supposed to be at 25 kilometers, but after 50% discharge, they're at 12 kilometers. That's the speed. So the solution is lithium and maybe technologies which come beyond lithium going forward. Uh, so I think any vehicle which comes on the road moving forward will have to use uh, battery solutions which are far more efficient maybe even than today because even lithium has, you know, a whole host of issues around it. And uh, though it's currently the solution, but I think in the West a lot of work is being done to bring in more efficiency and that's the core of the success of electric vehicles globally is your energy pack. Energy pack. We just have a few more questions. Uh, hi, my name is Ashok. Uh, so basically, uh, I think all of you have a, your own uh, charging infrastructure. Is there any option that you are sharing uh, infrastructure with each other? Uh, you should take that. So uh, we have our own and we have a shared charging infrastructure. It's open for all. So <laughs> I hope that answers the question. So we essentially are building charging infrastructure which gives open access to everyone. Yeah, right from the single individual rickshaw driver to the to the largest fleet operator, they have equal access to our charging infrastructure. I think yours is uh, energy as a service company. If you compare Precisely. with say yeah. uh, manufacturers or uh, fleet owners, it's the same for them also. Or it's a. Uh... I I don't think so. Uh, you know, we we are fairly unique in the sense, and uh, and uh, at this point in time, we actually don't have much of a charging infrastructure. Available. You have you have public charging infrastructure, which is largely funded by EESSL, so that's open access, right? But apart from that, you really haven't seen many of the OEMs setting up the own charging infrastructures. What has happened, though, is fleet operators. Some of the fleet operators have their own charging infrastructure, which is not open access. Yeah. So you have uh, you have uh, you have the e-rickshaw uh, operators here in Gurgaon, which have their own charging infrastructure. You have small fleet owners across India who have their own charging infrastructure. These are 15, 20, 30 vehicles at best. Yeah, That's by design, it cannot be open access.
Hi, my name is Varun Sethi and I'm a, a, a freelance practitioner in the capital markets IPO readiness space. Uh, much, if, if you see the larger uh, clean technology space uh, in the renewable energy segment, the types of companies like Azure Power, Renew Power and uh, Adani Green have gone in for capital markets listings uh, within India and outside and including a dollar bond raising. How, how far uh, do you feel that EV has come along and how far is it from a, uh, from a mature capital markets listing or do you really see that as a viable finance, uh, fundraising option or not? So, 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 so there, there, there are a lot of fundraisers by the electric vehicle industry from the VC space, PE space and capital markets is certainly uh, some, some way ahead. Um, my only question is, do you see that as a viable option, uh, an IPO listing? Or is it, is it a viable option anytime sooner, later, three, three years, four years, five years, kind of? I think on that level, it's a bit early to say that. Uh, still, uh, electric vehicle has to go a long way because from the numbers perspective, from the technology perspective, from the innovation perspective, still EV in India is at very really early stage. But yes, down the line, four years, five years, I definitely anticipate that uh, uh, you will see a lot of companies. First of all, I think uh, this industry will again have a big consolidation which need to happen because you have so many uh, you know, uh, companies who are uh, planning to enter or have entered either in two-wheeler space, three-wheeler space, uh, fleet operators, battery strapping. So every area you will find uh, companies coming in. So uh, I think it's still uh, a long way to go, four to five years minimum what I anticipate for IPO and that kind of scenarios, but will, that will definitely happen. I think consolidation is the first primary thing which will happen. Uh, then you can think of where you can increase numbers. Right now, if you see the total uh, automotive industry, uh, we are not even 0.1%, not even daily production of big companies like Hero Motor Corp or, uh, you know, Bajaj. Uh, the whole industry for the year is not there. So it's a long way to go for that perspective uh, from IPO segment. Thank you. Any last question from anybody? Okay, so we end this session. Thank you so much for your patience. And okay, we have, I can't see. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry. Hi, uh, this is Manish. Uh, I am from MrWarranty.com. I have one question uh, directed towards Mr. Lohia and uh, Mr. Piyush Gupta. In uh, uh, conventions, I understand that uh, it has been discussed that battery swapping is a much better and viable model as versus uh, battery charging. So one question is that uh, in battery charging, battery has a limited life and the driver is forced to buy a new one after a certain period of time, which doesn't need to be controlled. But in a battery swapping system, how will that life be defined? And when is he you know, forced to buy a new battery, if at all? So uh, I'll take this first. In our model, the life is 24 hours. Yeah? So in, after, after one swap, you get a new battery. And we basically guarantee the performance for 24 hours or 48 hours, whatever, you, whatever period of time you are taking that battery for. I understand that. My question is that uh, there is a battery capital cost also. So when you are swapping the battery, you are only charging for the charge. It may be, you know, 50 rupees more than the normal charging. Mm -hmm. But there is a battery capital cost. Who mm -hmm. is bearing that? Because if he is buying the vehicle without the battery, then who is bearing the battery cost in the initial phase itself? If he gets the ba one battery with the vehicle, then when he buys the second one? That's my question. Okay. So in that case, uh, the, uh, there are two models that are currently being, uh, uh, that we are working on. One is uh, the battery is given as a subscription and there are financial partners who are taking it on their books. That's, uh, that's what's working for, uh, for open access market for, for, for basically small uh, one or two uh, size customers. For larger fleet operators, uh, the fleet operators buy the batteries and uh, we manage the batteries for them. Thank you. Okay. No, no, so, so we end this session. Thank you so much for all our panelists and sharing their time and effort and insights on this. And thank you to the audience for their patience and questions. Thank you, gentlemen.